Hello, Ryan here, and welcome to Star Citizen Sunday. This is a weekly show which covers all of the news from the week just past. Be sure to subscribe if you like what you see, and let's get on with it. This week, Alpha 318.1 hits the PTU to address all these major issues with the live build. We catch up with the turbulent environmental team, plus we hear about one of the biggest quality of life gameplay changes coming in Alpha 319. So, before we begin, a quick update on the status of Alpha 318. On the PTU, or Public Test Universe, CIG have just released the 318.1 patch for stress testing. This build, which they are asking players to stress test over this weekend, brings with it multiple new systems that they say should significantly reduce strain on the back end, which was what's causing various issues with inventory, entitlements, and account logging. So hopefully many of these 19k, 30k errors stopping players from getting in. This build also has all of the numerous hotfixes which were recently applied to the live build, along with a new database and new ship delivery system. So hopefully this means the ASOP terminals will work correctly and get you all of your ships again. So over the course of this weekend, they will be holding multiple one-hour concurrency tests where they tried to get as many players in as possible to stress the database services to see how well they stand up and behave, and then they will address any issues as they occur. Also, it was mentioned over on Spectrum that while they try to avoid a wipe, given the state of the database and large number of hotfixes, it is looking more and more likely that there will be a partial wipe upon release of the 318.1 patch. Now, this will mean that any item bought within the game will be wiped. However, your Alpha UEC earned and reputation will remain intact. So basically stop buying ships and components in the game, but do continue to play and grind and earn that cash and just wait for the build to go live and then spend all that money that you've earned. Hopefully once Alpha 318.1 releases to live, everyone will be able to get in and it will be more a case of just optimizing and refining the build and not dealing with these game breaking bugs or connectivity issues. But do let me know in the comments if you were previously unable to get into the live build but can now join the PTU build, or not if the case may be. My fingers are firmly crossed that this is the final stretch to get 318 stable and working as intended. So this week's Inside Star Citizen was one of the best to date. It spoke about tracked beams and what we have now and what CIG want for the future, starting with Alpha 319. So right now the multi-tool tractor beam can be used to move boxes or other items around, it can move bodies around, which is very handy, especially when responding to medical beacons, but it can also be used as a grapple in zero G. Now it is quite limited in its interactions, as it cannot interact with everything beyond what is stated at this time, but for the future, they want to introduce more variants to the FPS tractor beam be that more attachments for the multi-tool perhaps, say one that could maybe carry heavier weights, but also introduce the dedicated handheld tractor beam. So they are looking deeper into tractor beams and their use cases and have them make sense to what you are wanting to move. So for example, the multi-tool attachment tractor beam should not be able to move large cargo containers around, whereas the dedicated tool should. Beyond handheld tractor beams, there are ship tractor beams, like with salvaging for both the Reclaimer and the Vulture. We will soon be able to tractor ship debris into the grinders where it can be processed into saleable commodities. But for other vehicles in general, there could be remote turret tractor beams. So for example, a Starfarer could use these tractor beams to tractor in mining pods so it can refine them or detach the fuel pods to trade. And for the whole series, having a remote turret maybe to track the boxes onto its spindles. And of course, we have the Argo SRV, which is a ship towing tractor beam to help recover stranded ships. Now, for the future, they even said that they want to have some ships with offensive remote tractor turrets, which could allow us to tractor a person in place, holding them in place, or tractor them into the ship, which would be a very interesting idea. So many use cases for that in both friendly and, and not so friendly cases. But beyond this, I think it would be very cool to have a ship like the SRV that is not meant for industry, but for holding a ship in place while others board it, which is great for law enforcement or for bounty hunting, but also for pirates as well. Anyway, they also want us to be able to combine tractor beams and increase their functionality, or maybe fight over items like cargo, or even grapple small ships perhaps with a dedicated tractor beam. 
Now this shows the scope in which tractor beams can expand gameplay pretty largely and the potential for all types of tractor devices from industry, offensive and defensive purposes. They are pretty much limitless in what they can do. Now, for 319, there are big changes coming to the multi-tool tractor beam. He does say they are working on the SRV, which sounds like they are essentially confirming that they're trying to get the Argo SRV in for 319, which would make perfect sense considering the amount of ships that are now just lying around in various states, thanks to persistent entity streaming. But they also found while working on the SRV, that they can bring the ability to strip ships of items like components and weapons earlier than anticipated. So basically removing, replacing, stealing the currently physicalized components and weapons from ships for our own use or trading. Now this is a massive change and affects all of us in many ways. And to learn more about how this will impact us as the player, do check out my roadmap video linked below, which goes into a lot more detail than what I will do today. But for 319, for example, you could stumble upon a ship, be that in working order, soft death or destroyed. And even if you don't have a salvaging ship, so long as you have a tractor beam attachment and multi-tool, you will be able to remove the ship weapons, its missiles, and the current available components, as not all intended components are physical yet, just what is currently available, and then swap them with your own or sell them on. Now they did say in order to gain access to these items, if the ship is still in working order, you will need to gain access to the bridge and then press the unlock items button, which will then allow you to take them. Much like how we have with salvaging and you need to turn the shields off before you can salvage a ship. So players can't just take your items at free will, you will need to kind of give them access or permission to do so. Now it also sounds like the multi-tools ability is increasing somewhat, likely while they continue to balance tractor beams in general for the future, but its weight limit and volume has increased, and we will be able to remove components up to size 2, so that's size 0 for ground vehicles, size 1 and 2, and for weapons, ship weapons, up to size 5. Now again, this is not all components, as some of them are not physically represented in game yet, or others are hidden behind walls that are yet to get access points, but that is still the vast majority of components that can be taken. Also, do check out the spirit interior here, from what I've been told, and the new item port system, which highlights all the attachment points of a ship in a much cleaner way compared to what it used to be. Now, this is a big change, as we will be able to customize our ships or rearm them with missiles without needing to store the ship first, then go into your Moby Glass and the VMA. The VMA will still likely be available to change paints and items that are not physical yet, but for the most part, it won't be needed. And regarding exploiting the system, they did say that by removing components and selling them, then respawning or reclaiming your ship, as it stands right now for 319, if you do this, it'll be considered a crime and you will get a crime stat, but they are still looking at other ways to prevent players from doing this. And I think soon we will start to see changes coming to the insurance timers and prices to discourage players from exploiting these systems, which will play into the intention of making it more viable to have your ship towed to a repair station or repair it in the field versus self-destructing and respawning. So do expect timers and prices to increase for insurance in the near future once we get the SRV in and the ability to kind of bring our ships back from almost dead, but I'm sure we will hear more about this and their intention in the future. Now, one other massive improvement that this whole physical component removal brings is for mining and eventually salvaging. Being able to swap your mining laser and consumables or subcomponents in the field without having to return to a station, store your ship and then open the VMA again. Now, this again is a huge change and alongside the mining changes coming in with 319, it is going to be very important as you will be able to put all the mining laser heads in your prospector or your mole. And if you come across a resource that requires a specific mining setup or a mining laser, you can then just on the fly physically swap it out there and then and get back to mining. And they did say that once the salvaging ships get different salvaging attachments, you will be able to do it with those as well. And it was also mentioned on Spectrum that they are working to try to get the ability to remove the saddlebags from the mining ships in for 319. They cannot confirm this yet because it still requires other work from other teams, but they are trying. So fingers crossed we will be able to do that because that again expands on mining gameplay, multi-crewing, and it is a big change. 
For the Starfarer in 319, we will be able to remove the refueling pods and either attach them to your own ship so you could sell a full pod to another Starfarer or steal one. So I suppose as long as you have a hold big enough to store a, a Starfarer pod, you could chuck it in there and then potentially sell it. Could have fuel wars going on. But to finish with, we have no idea how much ship weapons or components will sell for once we've removed them. It could be simply 50% of their value, could be less, could be more. So lots to work out there, and I'm sure we will hear more about that. But it could even be based on condition. I'm not sure if wear and degradation of weapons and components are in for 319. That is the intention for the future, which will drastically affect their price or their resale price. But we don't know yet for 319. So lots of questions yet to be answered. But this has definitely got to be one of the biggest quality of life features to date. And it is only going to grow from here. And I cannot wait to see this expand and get it into 319 to start with. Again, do check out the roadmap video, which will speak further about the gameplay that this kind of brings or enhances. It is fascinating stuff. But we must move on to Star Citizen Live. So this week's Star Citizen Live was chatting with members of the Turbulent Environmental team. And these guys are in the UK to connect with the UK environment teams as they are working on the underground facility exteriors, which are currently approaching the end of White Box. Now, other members of this team are working on Lawville 2.0, building interiors and the additional derelict settlements. And talking further about Lawville 2.0, which Jared did say he will do a follow-up on more thoroughly during Inside Star Citizen next quarter. The new Lawville has changed a little bit more since we last saw it, after they read a lot of the feedback from the backers, but are just wrapping up and polishing it. It is in the last two weeks of remaining work, and he says that when we fly out of the hangars, it is going to feel like a totally different experience. Now, Lawville 2.0 is coming with 319, which is set for around quarter two right now. I think Jared said May. It's usually end of June, but we will see. But they did say the main focus right now is getting 318 sorted. With the 318.1 patch, which has just gone to the PTU, I will have probably spoken about that already. Uh, and he does also say 318.2. It could have just been a passing comment. It is certainly not a commitment. But I think a 318.2 is a likely patch. We will see. Uh, but a lot of the work on the new Lawville is to make way for the upcoming building interiors, which leads on to the next subject. Now, they do address the whole street level for cities. A lot of people, including myself, would love to see a fully developed city, a bit like Night City. But right now, it is not the plan to expand cities to the level of something like Night City from Cyberpunk, as it will require so much more work. And they are not just building one city to be the only play area for Star Citizen like you see with Cyberpunk. They are building hundreds of these landing zones in all the systems. So to do something to the scale of Night City is not really plausible at this time. In the future, they may want to see if they can expand the cities to be much bigger and offer more street areas to explore. But right now, that is not the plan. It is mostly getting things set up for things like building interiors. Talking of which, right now they are creating the lobbies, apartments, common areas and office spaces and getting these separated into modules to then integrate into the procedural tool so that they can generate many of them quickly. Now, they have been shown somewhat of a prototype building, which had its rooftop access and then every other element for each floor down to the lobby and eventually exiting the building. So they are now progressing with that. And the next step, they say, is just to keep adding more modules, create more diversity, including different access points, and then continue pushing it. Now, this is really exciting to hear, as it does sound like the first building types will have apartments inside, which could very likely mean player apartments, with the work on the progress tracker for Persistent Habs finishing around the August time. So it's great to see that the work on these building interiors are making moves, and I don't think it's going to be too long till we have our own Persistent Apartments in somewhere like Lawville. Hopefully this year, that would be exciting, but even if it's still way off, having many building interiors of many types in Lawville and eventually every landing zone will be very exciting, especially for gameplay. Now, one of the devs is supporting the teams working on the derelict settlements, which is also a feature coming in 319. And this is using this Rastar tool, which right now they are building up the library of all the different modules for the Stanton system. Although he does say that every module that is created can be used in Pyro as well. But he does state that to create one settlement, 
it usually takes around one to two weeks, and one to two weeks being the longest it can take as the Rastar tool can help to push out so many of them. And an example he gave is that Whistler's Crypt, which is the derelict settlement on Daymar, that took three months to build. And now with this Rastar tool, they're basically bringing 15 settlements in three months. And these will range from sizes small, medium, and large. I'm not sure what Whistler's Crypt is classed as, probably a medium one if I was to guess. But this is pretty crazy, as this will massively expand locations in the PU, and it will only become faster from here. They also mentioned that there are two Reclaimer settlements coming, but I don't know if this is for 319 or later on, but these will be much bigger than Ghost Hollow that we have on Microtech. So that is 15 more settlements coming in with 319, potentially others, like the two Reclaimer settlements. But Jared did mention during this segment that there are also another team working on more settlements that are scheduled for 3.20, so 3.20, that we will see on Inside Star Citizen uh, in a few weeks. So interesting, he mentions 3.20 and 3.18.2. Now again, this does not confirm these patches, it could just be Jared talking off the cuff, but it certainly seems plausible to have a 3.20 or even a 3.19 point something patch between quarter two and the end of year. So we will have to keep our eyes peeled on the roadmap, and likely hear more about it there. Now, the beauty of all the work that they are doing in all these areas, be that building interiors, underground facilities, settlements, basically everything, it all flows from one planetary system to the next and will continue to grow with diversity. So this is all foundational work for eventually populating every single system in the PU with more points of interest. So that was the chat with the Turbulent Environmental Team. Great hearing more about the work that is going on there and it sounds like they are making extremely great progress with many mandates in the works many of which are coming in with the 319 patch, which is shaping up to be quite a beast of a patch. Now, the second half of Star Citizen Live was with a chap called Lucas, who is actually in charge of hiring globally for CIG. Now, he spoke about his work and how it's going, and he has been involved in over 700 hires in the last four years, and he did say that last year there were 25,000 applicants. Now, something interesting that he mentions is that they do a lot of really proactive work with helping to get more people into the gaming industry, like giving talks and going to colleges and helping to build out curriculums, which he says is part of their long-term growth plan, bringing more talent into the industry, as there is a bit of a difficulty finding highly experienced developers for what they need. So they're starting from the ground up and helping to just develop these people in the industry so that they can then hire them later on plus working on training programs and helping to create a better route into the gaming industry to increase diversity, which is actually really interesting as it is helping to further improve the gaming industry as a whole, not just for Star Citizen, but for everybody. So it's very fascinating and very proactive, and I love hearing that they have a hand in all this. Now, this is actually a very interesting chat to learn more about what they look for in a potential hire and how to go about applying to Star Citizen or to CIG. So if that is something of interest to you, I highly recommend watching it. But as you can imagine, nothing juicy regarding development was mentioned here. Now, Inside Star Citizen next week is the last one for this quarter before its four-week hiatus. And it is bringing back an old favourite, which is an all-episode sprint report. So cannot wait for that. But that was Star Citizen Live. Let us move on. So also this week, the narrative team answer more of our burning law questions with a new lawmakers community Q&A. And finally, the roadmap was updated, which, as I say, only brought one change, but it was a huge change. And to learn more about why, I have linked that video in the description below, should you want to learn more. So that brings us to the end of the show. If you do enjoy my content, please consider subscribing and hitting that like button. Also, I am able to do this thanks to my very generous patrons and channel members. If you appreciate what I do and would like to help make it even better from as little as $1 a month, all of the links are provided below.